Great to see you, Kia. Say how's it going? Great to see you, Peter. Great to see you uh, again. I, I feel like we uh, passed each other virtually in Michigan a few weeks ago. Right. Yeah. You gave a great, fantastically inspiring <laughs> talk there to our students, which was a great, uh, a great finale to our weird semester of being, you know, online on a Zoom. But it was a great way to go out. Absolutely. I'm excited for the art of revision, though. Oh, okay. Well, I'm we so get... thrilled to get to talk to you about revision. Actually, I mean, yeah. it's it's funny, you know, I. I, just, I have to say, I just love this book. It's so fantastic. Oh, it's a brilliant, you. brilliant book in its own right. I mean, I, I mean, it was hitting so many pleasure centers for me. It's a profound book, but it's also a hilarious book. You know, right. we might get to talk about how you managed to pull off that alchemy. Right, right, right. right. For that. Um, but I also, um, I just love the way it's genre bending. It's sort of mind bending. It's sort of like a sci-fi metafiction. So there's tons of stuff here that I absolutely <laughs> love. I was really excited about to see on the page. Thank you. But I'm really thrilled to get to talk about about revision with you about on, on this question as well. Um, you know, it feels, uh, you know, I've often said that revision sometimes feels like a kind of invisible art because we often get yes. to see just the last draft by something. Right. So the idea that we get to talk about that process, you know, and think a little bit about, you know, the earlier version that came out in 2013, Ooh. revised and republished in, in, in 2021. Yeah. Um, is really fascinating, but it also feels really appropriate to this book. Actually, I was thinking because you know yes. the very title of Long Division, yeah, you know, has that idea of showing your work in a math to say No question. And so no we get to see a little bit about you showing your work in this. Yeah, um, I, I meant it to be meta, you know, and and I think the question is if you live long enough, how meta can you make it? And and I think republished in a different version of of long division was one step in the right direction. Yeah, well, actually, you know, you know, I've got a, a whole slew of questions. I'm going to jump around a little bit. But mentioning that living long enough, I do think that time plays a huge part of the revision process for all no of doubt. us. And um, I was struck, you know, reading all of your work these last month or two, uh, it felt like heavy and how to kill yourself slowly in America, they feel like companions to long division because it feels like you often talk about the writing process in both of those books. So it felt as though I was sort of seeing an evolution of long division moving through that space. And, and you have an amazing quote, I'm, I'm forgetting which book it, um, it comes from, where you're sort of talking about um, this idea when you were working, I think, uh, on uh, long division, I put everything I ever imagined in that novel because I couldn't see myself living beyond 32. Yeah. And then I think you mentioned elsewhere that you bought the rights back right. uh, to the book and to the essay collection when you were 42. And yeah. so I'm wondering how time and age have played into the revision process. Oh, my goodness. You started, <laughs> you, <laughs> you jumping in. Right? No, no jabs. We just throw in hooks and, and uppercuts. This is softballs as well. We could do some of those. First. No, no, no. That's, that's a great place to start. You know, um. Uh, you know, when, when I was working on those two books, Long Division and How to Slowly, I was just one of those people, and I'm sure we all know if we aren't those people who sadly put all of their identity into the writerly basket, right? So, so you know, if an editor told me they liked some work I did, I thought that meant an editor said they liked me. And if an editor liked me, I thought I was worthy of not just a book deal, but of, of life. And you know, Long Division and How to Slowly, those first two books, I think they sort of, they reek of that sort of desperation that that feel, that you feel when, for people who don't know they're going to be here. We, you know, we don't need, none of us know we'll be here tomorrow, but some of us think for sure we, we, we won't. And, and those two books, like, you know, I think there's a difference between desperation and hunger. Before I can talk about revision, I have to talk about origin. And I, I you know, at that age, for lots of different reasons, different things that were happening in my life, um different things I was putting other people through um that they should not have had to go through I I just was so desperate to get the books out um and they and, and you know and both of those books are about books you know what I mean like they I, I write about books I write about kids and I write about books and I write about often our our refusal to revise even though we know revision is one of the only things that's going to save our children and ourselves and so once I understood that you know, then then I did what I like to do in my art, you know, which is to, to, to take a question or a premise and see how much I can fuck up a genre. And that's what long division is. You know, I mean, long division is like my attempting to stay alive, ask questions, subtextually talk about parenting, about parentage, think about what it means for certain kinds of kids in our culture to never, to be encouraged to write themselves off the face of the earth. But at the end of the day, I'm also just trying to look at the American novel as I knew it at the time and trying to like mangle it and make something I hadn't seen. And I couldn't do that as much as I wanted 
because you know I was a new writer. I couldn't control the production. You know, I couldn't control the font. I couldn't control like you know what was on the cover. And so once I got my money up and lived a little longer than I thought I would live, I just tried to go back in there, Peter, and 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 be ethical, be more ethical, but also be a little bit more audacious with with like the novel as 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 art, not just what's inside the novel, but the novel as like a physical entity that we turn pages in. So yeah. Yeah, no, I love that about uh, about the process, and it's incredibly bold, I think, um, but but really moving to me. Actually, I think you talked about uh, buying back the books and publishing the way they deserve to be published as an act yes. of love. And I really like that idea that there's a sense of that we owe a kind of duty of love to our work. I think, as well as to ourselves, and to the effort going into this. And you even talked about the duty of love to Mississippi as well. So it, right. It's depicted in the books as well. And that, that seemed like a really touching and a really smart way of thinking into the work along the way. Um, maybe we could, you know, this is a book that touches on questions of time travel which you know as we've been suggesting feels as though it's part and parcel of the erosion process for any writer we live into our lives the way we think about work the way work right. changes for us i think is is shaped by time um but maybe we can start off by jumping in the way back machine and go back to the very early conception of the project which i know yeah. goes back obviously before the, the first edition was published in 2013 um i'm curious about the initial moments of conception, when this book, Long Division, first came into your mind, and and really interested in some of the inspirations behind it as well. Man, um, oh, I love these kind of talks. We get to we get to get into it. Uh, you know, I I grew up listening to a lot of hip hop, and 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 really reading a lot of hip hop. You know, like I, I was one of these kids. Like I was that last generation of kids who knew what it was like to not have the internet, to not have hip hop. And then to see it. And one of the things that I think we loved about hip hop that we didn't have the words was like its intertextuality, the way it would always reference itself. Like so many hip hop songs are about hip hop itself as a culture, as a music. So I was just really torn. I didn't, I didn't know at the time what meta meant, but I was really into art that was about art and the listener. Like that, that, that's what I love. That's sort of in the absence of like great formal teaching in the schools. I feel like a lot of us found informal, formal teaching in music and culture. So when I finally, you know, I get to graduate school, I'd never written any fiction before, except a short story or so. And I was trying to spin that short story into a novel. And all I really wanted to do was like follow this notion of this character who was a round runaway character attempting to run away from a narrative. Like that's, that's where Long Division starts, right? There's this character, I don't know the character's name. I'm not sure the planet, the narrative planet, the character inhabits, but the character is trying to run away from the narrative. And of course I was hearkening back to like my people in Mississippi and, 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 and also I've been doing, my mother had been doing a lot of archival work about our folks who ran and why they ran and where they ran. So that was the notion initially is like, how do I create a meta book about a round runaway character who's running? I was in grad school. So, you know, one of the beautiful things about schooling period, whether it's informal or formal, if you have not great teachers necessarily, but also great classmates, they can be like, yo, have you read this? Have you read this? And I had a friend be like, you know, have you read um, Cervantes? Have you read Don Quixote? And I was like, yeah. He, they were like, but hey, did you really read it? And I was like, nah, <laughs> you know, it was in school. I didn't read that shit, reread. <laughs> so I reread that. Um, another partner was like, uh, I think you should read some Borges. And then I read that uh, Borges and I, Borges and me. And uh, and that was, that was, and then I, and then I really listened, I mean, like, ad nauseum listen to this story called I mean this this, this uh song called the art of storytelling by outcast and you know there's there's a there's a there's a character in that in that song called Sasha Thumper and for me Sasha Thumper and Bay Shepherd were sort of sharing the same heart so I knew I had this Bay Shepherd character I knew I had a premise and round runaway characters and I had a desire to write a meta book about characters who run away from the narrative that was the beginning. That was that was the that was that was the that was the beginning of the book. I love that idea. It actually, it's reminded me of a number of things. You know, that, that idea of revision sometimes being invisible or writing over its own traces also makes me think about your interest in disappearance of characters in oh, the book absolutely. as well, and whether you know, and even that idea of you know, thinking as you were writing it, you might not, you know, it might be the only book you wrote, you might not live that much longer. Those, those feelings of, will these characters live into the future seems also like one of the underlying sort of profound questions that the book is thinking into. Absolutely. Well in and, and, and hauntings, you know, like this is one of the reasons that Jasmine's work is, Jasmine Ward's work is just, uh, 
it's so sublime to me because I feel like she's managed and found a way to write and talk about 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 hauntings, like the hauntings of right. uh, as we move through space, right? So as we move through space, if we are haunted, we are necessarily haunting the spaces that we move through. And <laughs> I mean, Long Division is completely about, I think, the hauntings. Like Bay Shepherd haunts that first that first book, book one from 2013. You know, she she haunts, she animates. I think she writes. It. And so I just wanted to just do a little, a little, play a little different. And 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 as a writer, I mean, I, I feel like we both know these characters, they do not stop playing around with you because you feel like you're done with a book. You know what I mean? They do not stop tickling you. They don't stop like jabbing you in your chest. They don't stop like, you know, whispering and, you know, you'd be somewhere, you'd be like, what you say? And I'm like, I ain't say shit. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like that was that character, you know, like, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm not someone who's very precious about that. Like, I know these characters are alive in my head, in my body. I know they make my body and my head do things that I wouldn't do were they not alive. And once you accept that, you sort of have the obligation to allow them to follow them as they want to be followed. And that's the thing about master narrators, right? So I knew my kids want my characters, I called them my kids. I knew my characters wanted to run away from like traditional white, like normative narration. But then as I listened more, I was like, yo, they want to run away from me. So then it's like, what do you do? Like, how do you follow characters that want that necessarily want to run away? And Long Division, amongst other things, is I think a way of trying to answer that question. I mean, it's a book that doesn't end. You know what I mean? Like if, if you, it, it, it literally is asking you to continually like reread it like an elliptical over and over and over again with the hopes that the beginning will be different than the last time, the insides will be different than the last time, and you might be different than the last time. And that's what I was attempting to do. That book was, it was for me, you know what I'm saying? I understand now partially why I couldn't get that book published. Um, but I do, but that, that book was for me. I had to write that book technically to be able to do what I did in heavy. You know what I mean? Like I could not have, you talk about revision, I could not have done it. I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have done it had I not, had I not tried that book. So, and that means I couldn't have done heavy, which I think is like 75% successful had I not failed substantially in trying to do long division. <clears throat> And that's where I think revision, when I talk to myself and my students, to me, it is about like the, the majesty of failure. And that, that's, where, that's where I'm here. I'm here right now with you because I, I, I found out a way to embrace it, to look forward to the failure and, and hope that people find some, some meaning in it. Yeah, that's a great phrase that you use. I think it's in one of the books as well, that, that the rugged majesty of revision. I really like that phrase. Right. I feel like I'm going to be using that in classes myself. And it's great, you know, to think about, I mean, I love the sources of the work, you know, the, the way there's that mingling of, you know, what we might think of as traditionally high culture and popular culture, when we right. think of, you know, um, the Cervantes and the Borges and, um, you know, and Outcast. It's funny you mentioned Jasmine Ward, because I think Jasmine has an epigraph yep. from Outcast at the front of Salvage of the Bones as well, yep. right? And I know you yep. have the same thing as well. Yep. So it's great to think of that inspiration coming into that space as well. And I was thinking too about, and you may have mentioned this somewhere in some of what I was reading, but I was thinking a bit about, um, Octavia Butler, as I was reading this. Oh, yeah. And I noticed even one of the kids, one of the classmates of cities is called Octavia. Right? Oh, there's you a, know, because I'm borrowing. I'm stealing. Yeah. yeah, I'm stealing from Octavia. I'm stealing from Toni Morrison. I'm stealing from Tony Cade. I, I'm taking the idea of the Battle Royale from Ellison. Um, the entire book is built on the self-determination model that Fannie Lou Hamer put forth. So I just needed to put those names up front. So people, you know, would like get it, huh? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I, I, it's not like happenstance. Like, you know, these are these. This is a book heavily influenced by Tony K, Tony Morrison, Ralph Ellison, um, and Fannie Lou Hamer. And I just wanted folks to know that by page two or three. Yeah, no, I dug that actually. It felt like a nice yeah. nod to them, but also a nod to the reader, and it draws us into that sort of metafictional space as well. Right. Thinking about this text as a made text, I think in some ways as well, which I really dug. Thanks for taking it seriously, Peter. You know, like that's that's a dream, fam. Like I appreciate this. Oh well, you know what's so easy about taking it seriously though is I love the depth and the texture, right? It's one of those books. I, I like the way you're talking about. You can reread it, go back around with it, which also speaks to questions of revision and find right. new things in it. I think right. so. It feels like there are these. I mean. The simplistic way of talking about it would be to say Easter eggs, and they're more than that, of yeah. course. But I get, I, I just dig that stuff on the page. So I, I love I, I really Easter love eggs, that, that right. quality, right? Yeah. yeah. That was, that I mean, I, I don't like Easter eggs. Like as, a, as a, as a young fat boy in Mississippi, I was like, why the fuck we eating eggs when we could be eating candy? You know what I'm saying? But, but I love putting Easter eggs in my work for myself and for my people. And the cool thing about Easter eggs is like, 
particularly if you don't revisit a, a work after for like however long, you can find shit and you're like, oh my, did I mean to do that? And I'm like, oh yeah, maybe not, you know. Yeah, but I, I really love that quality. So I wanted to really ask about, um, I mean, and you will have a better sense of this than I do, um, but thinking about the two editions of the book, um, and, and, you know, I actually have a, a sidebar question, which is, how do you feel now about people reading the old edition? Would you prefer that to just vanish into the stack of uh. the used bookstores? I felt almost as though I was transgressing reading the old one, but I thought I should do my homework. Um, mm. So I'd like to come back to that question. But actually, the, the, I suppose the, the big questions I'm having or I'm curious about are the changes you made and both big and little. I think at some point uh, right. Long Division was also called My Name is City, named yeah. after the main character, yeah. uh, which I, I think was going to be, was, is that a name that your mom had thought about for you at one point? Uh, not City, but uh, Citoyen was a name that my mom, um, my mom wanted me to be named Citoyen. And um, my father was in Zaire when I was born, um, former Zaire. And, uh, and, <laughs> and my father met this dude who he loved. So he sent the name over and my mother was knocked out for many days after I was born. And my mama, let my mama tell it, Satoyan was supposed to be my name. My grandmama forgot because she was the only one there. And so she named me with my dad. It's <laughs> fascinating. Name. It's an interesting revision, right? Your name it is, is. Be this. It it is. Else. You get to write a book that has that character named uh, yeah. in that space. So it's again, it goes around, it comes around in really interesting ways. Um, so I was really interested in changes to titles. Um, at, you, you are really smart, even at the level of thinking about um, changing epigraphs. I think the epigraph right. uh, for How to Kill Yourself Slowly is different in the two editions, if I remember right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you've got that great outcast um, epigraph, which you've thankfully kept in the new edition of Long Division, but you ad added one by Erica Badu as well. So I really yeah. like that tiny attention to detail, which is, you know, I get a really vitally nerdy uh, pleasure out of seeing those things, but I Me really too. like that Me attention, too. right? Yeah. Um, but the big thing, of course, is the fact that, and I, I'm going to show this again for folks uh, at home, um, that this is that fascinating format where the book uh, reads both ways, right? So this is one of the big structural changes. And I think in the earlier edition, um, the, the novel within the novel, um, even though it was typographically different, it sort of read as uh, alternate chapters, roughly speaking. Yeah. I, I, I don't mean to, uh, I'm saying that a little bit crudely. And I, I, actually, I love this form. Um, sure. And I was, I actually, I was trying to, look up instances of it and i've learned i had never known this before there's some french phrase you maybe know this it's called tete à bêche my french yeah it's chilly um which means like head to tail or something so i, I love yes. the idea that there was this form in these ways but i also came across this idea that there was a um there was a, a kind of an older kind of pulp sci-fi imprint maybe ace would do ace doubles where they would have sci-fi books you know from the 50s and 60s in these editions where there would be two novels by different people in fact back to back in the same volume and there was something about um the genre mixing quality of uh, long division that made me think it was great to think about that form as well it felt like a kind of throwback in time as well which i really dug but tell me about that change that seemed like such an amazing fascinating you change. know the thing is um i just feel like Man, getting those first two books out was so hard, right? Which is ultimately why I ended up selling them for um, <laughs> like $4,000 total uh, at the end of the day, because nobody else would really mess with them. And I don't know how to explain it other than I, I really wanted my first book to, 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 to be like a neon piece of art, like in like when you saw it and felt it right and and i understand that like all book covers are art but sometimes i think we talk about what's inside of a book differently than we talk about the book and for me you know as as a, as a young boy who grew up with a mother who made him read all the time but then went to school and was taught by teachers who did not care to know the insides of any of us not just me i you know like the books that i had to read in school they might as well have been written backwards like they might as well have been written backwards, right? And part of that, you talk about hauntings. I don't know if we talk enough about the way classrooms are necessarily, in this, in this in America at least, necessarily haunted, which means so much of the reading that we're asked to do as young people 
also feels haunted and haunting. And sometimes we don't want to be haunted. So sometimes I think, you know, when, when we ask kids to read and they're like, I don't want to read, it's like, fuck, I don't want to be, fuck, I don't want to fuck with these ghosts right now. I don't want to have to read this shit that reads backwards. And so one of the wonderful things about Long Division to me, in addition to like how you flip it, you can flip it and reflip it and you can keep reading, is that I would like people to just look at the text that's written backwards because a lot of us, I'm not just talking about folks who have different, you know, have different kinds of ability or people who might be dyslexic. But I think, I think the act of reading backwards, reading that text backwards is, is, is a lot of our experiences in these American classrooms. And so like, I just wanted to say, well, what happens if we flip that shit over? You know what I mean? If we flip it over and we actually read these black Southern characters who, who are taking us deep as we want to go, not just into like their souls and their experiences, but in, 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 into the beginning and ends of American education. That's what that book is about to me. So to me, you can't do that if the art, if the, if the book itself is not a compelling, like, again, like, like neon kind of like, like art and, and that, that, that's tactile, right? Like, don't just flip a page, turn the shit over. Look at, you know, the book references the covers. Like I'm asking and telling people the in the middle of the book, you know, there's, there's, there's leaves. Like I'm, I'm asking us to like lose ourselves. I'm asking people to fill in that space in the middle of the book. So I'm asking way too much in that book, but I am asking. I'm definitely no, asking. And I love that. I, I love the way that you get to write a cover brief in the middle of the book. Right. Right. So that's right. fantastic that way of thinking into that space. Right. But even, um, you know, and I love the way you're thinking about reading. I do think, you know, in some ask backwards way, one of the ways we teach literature is to say to kids, this is great, your job is to figure out or be, learn why it's great, whereas they don't get right. to make up their own minds for themselves about why they love it or why it's great. And that does right. feel like it's sort of a cart before the horse uh, kind of question some of the time. Um, but you're, I, I love the way you also think into revision from a readerly perspective. I think there's a line in one of the books where you're, you're quoting or paraphrasing Baldwin talking about how reading a book twice is the readerly yeah. equivalent of revision for a writer. Yeah. And I think the linking of those two things seems really smart in those ways yeah. to me as well. But you're also thinking about this um, at the level of punctuation, I think, in really great ways as well. Okay. So tell me about, um, about the use of, we, you know, they're there on the cover, we get the ellipses. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. I don't know it's in the middle of the book. I mean, well. I'm, I'm about to nerd out, but but you asking me to nerd out. Yeah, sure. So it's okay. Yeah. You know, on the, like, I, I was, um, how do I talk about, you know, I, I wrote a lot of essays all through high school, uh, college. I got kicked out of school ultimately for some of the stuff I was writing, kicked out of college. And then I went to Oberlin and I, you know, was editing lots of different things. And, and I was writing, I was an essayist, but I didn't know you could go to college. I didn't know you could go to grad school back then. I don't even know if you could for, for creative nonfiction. I knew you could go for fiction. So I started trying to write one short story. Um, and it was about City's mother. And it was the third person story. Terrible, horrendous. I don't know how the fuck I got into grad school off of that story. Um, but it... <laughs> You know, I I wanted to play with this idea of not just having like parallel characters, you know, like, so there's a character called Lavender and then there's a character called Red um, Navel, right? The cat. If you read N Red Navel backwards, it is Lavender. But if you read Lavender backwards, it's Red Navel. So, so in my mind, I was just, I was really fascinated with this idea of like, oh, people are going to think, those who get it are going to think, oh, Red Navel is a revision of Lavender. But no, like to the cat, Lavender is the revision. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so like, then the number of characters in there, like three or four other characters that are mirror characters or two or three scenes in that book that are mirrored scenes where characters are like, I'm gonna go a different way because something in me tells me this is gonna happen if I go this way. The big performance scene uh, at the contest is one of those scenes. And then beyond all of that, I just started thinking about what it would mean for these different characters to embody different kinds of punctuation. And Bayes Shepard, like she, she's like, nah, like I'm the fucking ellipses. That's what I want to be. And because I'm just like obsessive, I kept looking up words where there was a built-in ellipses in English and division was one of those words, right? Dot, dot, dot. So for the revision of the cover, even I had to take the dot, dot, dot off division and put the dot, dot, dot below division as a nod <laughs> to, the, to the previous cover, but also just so people understand that like Bay Shepherd is, 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 is like heartily present on both covers of this book because she's heartily present on every page of this book. 
And I could say some other stuff about commas. I have a different character who I think embodies a comma, a different character who I think embodies a punct uh, um, exclamation point. But the most important character in their in, in, in their punctuation um, in their punctuation embodying is is Bayes. Um, and that was just again, fam. Like I was just trying to learn how to write fiction while trying to write fiction. But I think that's what we all do. You know what I'm saying? I think we all try to learn to write. Those of us who write fiction, we're learning as we go. But I just not written any of it. I read a ton, and so I just was like, you know, like what what's interesting and what are these characters trying to do? Not just with like character, persona, uh, ego, super ego, but what are they trying to do with like punctuation? And 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 the ellipses to me is is that that sort of like dynamic kind of punctuation that harkens to what came before it, but also just as equally welcomes what's coming after it. And I feel like that's long division. Yeah, no, I love that. I feel like that's a, that's a deep dive in the, into the meta. It's not just referencing other texts, but right. like the very building blocks of the language, right? And of course, many of the characters are really invested in thinking about language and individual words and all those kind of things. But yeah. I, I thought the attention to punctuation in this regard just seemed just great and profound. And it felt like it was really delving deeply into that space. And the quote, I, I think I isolated, it. I think it's Bayes, um, it was a line that also makes me think a little bit about um, revision. The ellipses always knows something more came before it and something more is coming after it. Yeah. Um, and that, that sort of, as a line reverberated for me, it, it says something about the way we position ourselves in time, the way we position ourselves in history, the way we position ourselves with respect to those who come before us, those who come after yeah. us, which for a time travel narrative makes perfect yeah. sense to me in lots of ways. Um, but it also raised a question um, which I think actually the um, even the way we were promoting this talk on on, on the Center for Fiction's um, website maybe spoke to you mentioned this about heavy. Um, I think you were doing a Q&A somewhere. I think the honest answer to the question of how long did it take you to write mm. heavy is I'm going to have to let you know when I'm done. The book is published, but the book is not done. Yeah. Um, and so that line about the ellipses, something comes before, something comes after. Um, maybe also think about doneness in <laughs> right, right. Uh, you know i think one of the things that uh, horrifies uh, maybe I, I understand this i sympathize with it some of my students about revision is jesus it's never over it just goes on forever <laughs> right. and, I, and often i actually try to comfort them by saying that there, there is an end point and we can talk about what that might look like um but it, it feels in really rich uh, imaginative creative actually life-affirming ways um that for you the revision is ongoing and it made me wonder whether or not there is a uh, there's a sense in which maybe there will be another edition of heavy you know 10 years down the line or whether you could imagine i, I think you talked a little bit at one point about um the essays in how to kill yourself slowly as being like tracks on an album which is i, I really love right. that metaphor actually for thinking right. about collections generally and it almost felt like when i was reading the new edition um that it was sort of like, oh, this is the one from the vault, right? This is like Prince's yeah. stuff, and we've got some new tracks, and we've got an uh, earlier cut or a later cut, or here's the acoustic version. And I really like that idea of reinventing the album as it moved forward. And I suppose there are, um, I think somebody in the chat mentioned uh, Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, that he just keeps revising for yeah. maybe half a dozen editions over 40 years. It goes from right. 12 poems to like 400 poems at, at the end of the process. Um, I was wondering if you thought that... Um, how you thought about doneness in the revision process, or if you thought there was no doneness, and if th some of these yeah. other works feel like they could uh, go on in time as you move it further into your yeah, life. I, I I really appreciate that, Peter. You know, sometimes when I'm talking about revision or writing about revision, I feel <laughs> what I wish. I was born. I was born and raised Christian Southern Baptist missionary, missionary Southern Baptist. And, and so when I when I critique Christianity, like, you know, I'm 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 not sure whether I call myself a Christian or not, though I'm highly influenced by Christian doctrine and Christian texts. And I think Christ was a bad motherfucker who I want to emulate. I just think there are a lot of other bad motherfuckers I want to emulate. So when I talk about Christianity, I'm not necessarily degrading it or folks who believe in it necessarily, because those are my people. But I I just really wanted to think. I think sometimes when I talk about religion and like, like revision is my religion, you know what I mean? Like, and so sometimes when I'm talking about re re revision, I want to make sure I'm not proselytizing. And that, that's what's hard as a teacher because we want our students to revise, but I, but, but I need to be careful and not, and not ask my students to live revision the way I actually think 
I need to, to be a decent person. And so for me, getting lost in the process of constantly assessing what ingredients I put into a text, a relationship, anything I build, like that to me is, is religion. And, and so will I revise heavy? I have revised heavy. The question is, will I revise heavy and put it in another like, you know, corporate artful entity called heavy? I do not think I'm ever gonna do that. You know, partially because that book is my mama and mine. Like we, we, we did that book. My mama does not wanna go back into that book. So I'm gonna have to let that book as its entity exists in the world. But when I give readings, I'm reading different shit than you see on the page. Like I'm never gonna, I'm never read from heavy the same way that the text is written. And some of the stuff that I learned in heavy through my failures, I tried to put in that, that Vox piece. Um, I tried to put in um, a few pieces I wrote for the New York Times. I tried to put in a few pieces I wrote for Vanity Fair. I'm definitely going in and doing this new 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 book I'm writing called Good God. It is a revision of heavy. Um, but yeah, I'm never going to go in there, restructure stuff, redo shit with the language and put it back out as heavy because I don't feel like I was the only person who wrote that book. You know what I'm saying? My mama, my mama was, was heavily involved and I know she don't want to, she don't want to do that. So we're not going to do that. But, but other than that, like it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a way of life is how I keep myself decent. If I'm successful at anything, it's because of my faithfulness and revision. Um, and it's, and it's sort of what I, I don't feel comfortable pushing it too much on my students, but I do feel comfortable pushing it on purported leaders people who purport to be leaders and don't want to fucking revise. I don't know how you do that shit. Like well, that. Actually, that was one of the things I wanted to come up to. I really like the way you're talking about that. I, I, I had a question here, but the way you're talking about it is religion makes perfect sense to me. I, I had a question about revision as a philosophy and about life. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a great line. You mentioned your, your mom, and I think there's a great line in Heavy where she talks about the most important part of writing and really life is revision. And that she really struck that. home for me. Yeah, right. It just seemed... Um, like an amazing thing to think into. Um, and, you know, so you've talked a little bit about that in the context of your own life uh, in ways that really resonate with me. Um, but I think you were beginning to lean into a question of revision and the life of the country and the nation, right? Mm. There's a line, I think, in one of the essays, one of the new essays in the new edition of um, How to Kill Yourself Slowly is a really powerful essay uh, about Mississippi awakening and charting the days of the pandemic. So, you know, it feels incredibly ripped from the headlines, really close, really amazingly powerful as well. And there's a line in there where you talk about um, uh, the former president's inability to honestly revise. Mm. And you also quote, I think, um, and maybe a high school teacher down there in uh, Mississippi, yeah. Ron Wilkinson, who says, um, and I, this line just blew me away, this nation's sin is its commitment to being the same. Yeah. It seems almost as though the greatest sin is a failure to think into uh, revision. And I was wondering if you could expand a little on those thoughts. I, I was just fascinated by them. It felt like they, it felt like, you know, we can talk about revision, of course, and we've got a lot of writers in the audience, I'm sure, as a craft issue, but I really love this sense of it blowing up into a way of living one's life, maybe a way of thinking about the world around us as well. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could say smart shit about this and the nation, but, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> It's so gross, you just have to describe it. And, and I don't know if there's any room for depth in the description. My experience of this nation is not just that it dislikes those who want to revise or it, it has disdain for those who wants to want to revise. Like this nation attempts to kill directly or over a long period of time, folks who want to revise. And, and, and that would be okay. But then what it does is it takes it, it takes credit for the revision that the reviser did in spite of it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you can see it specifically with, yeah. with, with King, but you can't, it's not just King. The, 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 this nation wants to claim as this civil rights was something that like, and the direct action that people in my state did was something that somehow that it, that it encouraged. No fam, it, it murdered people for attempting to revise a national narrative, what American exception, exceptionalism was. It, 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 it killed, it killed and murdered and maimed and refused to repair that killing, murdering and maiming. And then it wanted to take credit for it, though it killed, maimed and murdered. So I don't have any smart shit to say about it. I can just describe what happened. And, 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 if, and if I live to be one day older than I am now, 
I pray to God, I will not ever become that, but we write because part of us is that. You see what I'm saying? Like part of us is that same terrible ass shit that I described. And some of us might not do it on a national level, though I think we all contribute to empire, but lots of us do that shit in our interpersonal lives. And so this is where I think like the larger meta narrative and, and the master narrative and like just political shit, you know, that we see and we're part of, we have to also ask ourselves what our relationships are to that. And so that's why I'm saying it, it just gets tricky because I can critique this nation's investment in empire, this nation's refusal to, to, to revise. And there's somebody in the world who can make that exact same critique of me in the way that I've treated them. I don't think that makes me or the nation special, but unless we, we, we tend to it, I think we make it not just worse, but more painful. And so as an artist, I just don't want to make it more painful. Um, I want to make it liberatory. I believe in, in, in revolution. And I know writers don't like to talk that way, but I think we have a role in it. And, and it's sad that like encouraging systemic re 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 revision, which is not reformation, is, is suck fucking radical. But, but like, how is that radical? How is it radical to be like, we must assess how we got here today. We must talk about the ingredients of yesterday if we're going to talk about any shit tomorrow. That should not be a radical stance, but but it is in relationships. I know when I fuck up, I'm like, why are you bringing up old shit? Why are you, why are you talking about that old shit? Like, you know, we're here now. Let's look forward. Shut the fuck up, PSA. You know, like anybody who says that is trying to harm somebody or trying to not be held accountable. Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's where it is. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in that country. And I just try to use my art to do what I can do to, to make the world and myself more daring in that way. Yeah, it's really interesting because right? I think, you know, we value revision as writers, but I think in, in the nation or in a culture, revision can be an act of erasure and even an act of forgetting how we've got here and what's gone before. I think in some ways it can be comforting, I think, in strong, some ways. Like Definitely. Those lines Definitely. As well. You know, and I, I really like actually the association of revision with revolution. I think it actually makes it sound as energetic and as radical as it needs to be, even for writers on the page, of course. Absolutely. I, I mean, it's funny, we've been talking a lot about language in these regards. Um, and of course, I say this it, it, with respect and a, and a, a hint, hint of caution, as a Brit, when I think about the constitution, which has problems say in that three fifths clause for, no, for just for one example, um, the idea of it as a kind of version of holy writ that has to be attended to as if not a single word could ever be changed or meant or intended in other ways, suggests a kind of resistance to revision. So there may be something like that encoded even in our right. discourse, I think it's a basic and fundamental way, which seems challenging and, and maybe worth pushing back on, I think in some right. sense as well. Yeah, I, I, I want to make sure the one thing, yeah, one, please, and, yeah. and, and to me, to, be, to, to, to extend that, Peter, like the sickening part of us is that the, 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 the amendment <laughs> that, that, that a lot of people in my state, like, like if you look at amendments as like kinds of revision, I'm not sure if we can't, we should, but if we look like it's the second one, it's the right to fucking hold these things that can destroy human beings from 50, 60, 100, 200 miles. Away. Like that's, that's the that's the amendment that most motherfuckers that like <laughs> who I can't stand want to hold up is like we believed in revision we need that we need the right to bear arms that one really my g all of the revision we could be investing in and that's the one you want to talk right. about the right to fucking like hold guns and shoot holes in motherfucking like like pigeons people and porcupines come on j come on bro like that that's that's weak you know, and, 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 and I just think sometimes we need, we need to not just talk about like our, our, our inability to revise, but as a nation, why we hold on so much to particular like articles of revision. And that's one of the articles that I just think is like disgusting. And we cling to them, they become set in concrete. They yes. lose the flexibility that we want when we think about revisionary things. Absolutely. I mean, oh man, this is great. I, I, I have like literally another half a dozen questions I could post to you, but I'm aware that we have already been to begin to bump up towards, uh, you know, okay. not the end of our time, but I want to make sure we have some time for questions from the audience as well. Um, and so I'm going to switch over, I think, to the Q&A and encourage people too, if they haven't yet had a chance to do this, um, uh, to post questions. And I'm just going to scroll through a few of these. I, if I don't get to all of them, um, uh, my apologies. Um, uh, let me have a look. Sorry, I have to squint down my glasses to read the stuff in the chat and in the Q&A to do this. Um, uh, 
So here's one, and I, again, I'm jumping into the middle of these, there are a whole bunch of these questions. Um, how much do you think about your target audience when you go through revisions? So that seems like a really interesting one. I know you think a lot about audience, in fact. Uh, I mean, the audiences are sort of what, what dictate the, um, the kinds of revision I want to do. You know, at the end of the first version of How to Slowly Kill Yourself, there was a letter, and it was, I think it was called a letter to my first teacher, and it was a letter to my mother, where I was talking to her about failure and talking to her about, like, teaching. And, you know, I went back and I rewrote and I rewrote and, and really like rewriting that letter is ultimately what leads to heavy, you know? Um, actually, I rewrote that and I wrote a few things, one for The Guardian and one for uh, Gawker. And like that to me, that that became heavy. Um, but, you know, I didn't know it at the time. Um, I'm sorry, wait, say, say the last part of the question again. Uh, how much do you think about your target audience when you go through yeah. the auditions? Yeah, and and so and so in that initial letter, like I'm I'm writing to my mother, but I'm but I'm thinking about my students. Like that letter was like I was directly addressing my mother, but I was thinking specifically of the students that that I've had at that point in my life. I've been teaching since I was like 23, and and what I wish I could say to them that I could not, and what I want to say to them is look at me talk to my mama, and you know, in revision, I was like, all right, what happens if I actually want to solely talk to my mama like not not performatively from my students but actually my mother is my target audience and then of course as we know you know that that sounds good when you're talking about you know making these proclamations and all of that but how do you do that in scene work you know like how do how do you get an intimate scene with layers and sensory detail and then bring in a you especially a matrilineal you which which you don't want to think about sometimes when you're in these like intimate spaces and I think to me that that was the, the task of, of the writer, but I can't even get there unless I change the audience for all of my work. For most of my time, I sort of have been writing to my mama, but I sort of been writing like hoping she would see stuff and like, like me, which, which is different than writing directly to, you know? And so Heavy was one of the first times that I just wrote directly to my first teacher and the audience dictated that. So I'm thinking about audience all the time. I'm also changing audiences, not just like, in different books, but I think you can change the audience in pieces. I think you can change certain 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 paragraphs are dictated for certain audiences, certain par paragraphs are not. So I don't think I don't think audience in this nation, really anywhere, should be talked about statically at all. I really like that idea actually, because we often get fixed in that idea of an ideal reader, and you're actually speaking of an ideal group of readers in a certain sense, or you're thinking about speaking to many different readers within a single piece. That's yeah, a really rich think, way of thinking about that. I think we write to sensibilities much more than we write to people because people are just, you know composed of various sensibilities you know what i'm saying and so to me it's like what what sensibility are we foregrounding what i was attempting in long division i'm trying to foreground like a black southern idiosyncratic weird ass big eyed sensibility who gets the front row of a theater but then the other people who don't look anything like that front row who also get balcony or get right behind that and as a writer i'm sometimes writing to the balcony sometimes i'm writing to the middle but I'm always aware that whatever I do, that front row is going to be closest. They're going to see the spit come out of my mouth. You know what I'm saying? Like they're the little man at Shishaw Station, uh, Allison talks about. Um, so that front row means the most to me, but I'm aware that there's a lot of different sensibilities and audiences when we do this work. I, 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 I know that's true. But I love that idea of thinking about the audience as like a, a, a group in an auditorium, because yeah, yeah, that's a great way of thinking about the rest of space. Um, so here's a, an, another question. I, I think actually this touches on, um, uh, a couple of people are sort of leaning into this question. Um, in revising, do you find yourself wanting to insert new elements or scenes, taking a drafted scene to a greater extreme in a sense? Uh, and the writer says, as I'm revising my own novel, I find I'm inserting more new things than I ever expected, maybe a way of dramatizing ideas that have become clearer to me. Um, and I think yeah. somebody else asking this question is also wondering about what's the difficulty of going down that rabbit hole of ideas also how do you control that new imagination that new sense of discovery and right. keep the work um uh, you know shaped or corralled in some sense yeah um i i don't know the <laughs> i don't know the right therapy kind of language because my friends they they often talk to me in that therapy talk but i feel like this question is asking me to talk about compartmentalization and I, I just believe sometimes the performance of the book is very different than the writing or revising of the book. Do you know what I mean? Like the performance yeah. of the book. So, so in everything I've ever written, I've written drafts that were for me. And, the, and, 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 and those drafts change a lot, but I'm aware sometimes that like when I'm editing or what people call editing, like 
I'm, I'm not just thinking about the editor, but I'm thinking about, okay, I wrote the book I needed to write, but I think the book I might need to show might be different. And I think once you, once you get that, like once you, once you understand that some of the shit you think is your best writing can be your best writing to you, but you got to understand other motherfuckers ain't going to like that shit or, or even want to fuck with it. Like, I, I don't know, like that, it, it's a, it's a, it's a healthy compartmentalization for me. You know what I mean? Like the heavy that I wrote for me and my mama solely was a completely different book that had so much more in there about emotional deception, about sexual violence of children, about guns, about gun violence, about incarceration of young people. I wrote that for us. My mama was like, all right, Key, you ain't showing that book to the world. And I'm like, oh, yes, I am. And then I'm going right back in there and I'm taking the shit out, right? Because because I'm not, I don't need to show her that. But that version or a version of like that exists in the world. And I, I just feel the same way about most things. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just feel sometimes there's, there's a book that I want to show, but I can't get to that book I want to show the world until, I, until I've written the book that necessarily like satisfies parts of me that I didn't think could be satisfied. That's, that's, that's actually true. <laughs> what I just said is actually true. Like, yeah, no, for, me, like, for me, for me. Yeah, no, I think it's really important for us not to lose sight, even though we think about audience, the part that satisfies us, that speaks to us as a kind of truth and a sincerity in that process. Yeah. Um, here's a question um, uh, that is one that is close to my heart and I hear from students and I think it speaks to an anxiety that I have as well. It's the, um, it's touching on the difficulty of, of revising too much. So the question is phrased, what are some of the signs that we as writers have gone past the point of revision to a place where the magic of the work has been tarnished? Have you had this happen to you? Have you been able to backtrack? It's this sort of feeling of sometimes overdoing it, over polishing it, you know, making it seem, get to a point where it's a little too precious or something yeah, or some of the magic is yeah. lost. And, and, this is, and this is why this is what I'm trying to say. Sometimes I feel weird talking about revision because, <laughs> because, because my understanding of revision, I'm not sure how product-based it is. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not sure how, how interested it is in have we gone too far in revision? Because like, like sometimes you're going to go too far. Sometimes you're going to take a piece of art that could be widely and, 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 and deeply loved and you're going to fuck it up. Like, like sometimes you will do that if you invest in revision and sometimes you won't, but, but principally, I'm, principally, I think we always must be interested in looking back at something and asking ourselves how it could be different with the understanding of, of, of what can come, of, of what possibilities can come in the future, not just what products. And I believe that when I didn't have a dime to my name and I didn't have nobody reading my books. Do you see what I'm saying? Like I, and, 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 but I never try to put that on anybody. Like I understand the writer leaving like, can we go too far and fuck up the product? Yeah, yep, yeah, you can. But, but, but like, but, but I'm okay. I'm okay doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm okay. I'm okay going back and looking and looking. And then my friends would be like, but see kids say, that's your problem. You can't let nothing go. So I'm saying I get it. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm definitely one of those people who's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely one of those people who like I go into, you know, I can't go to AWP for a lot of reasons only go one time, but like I'll be up at AWP and uh, the last time I went, I only went one time in Tampa and I'm rolling as hot as motherfucker. And I'm like, I'm, my, 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 my boy's like, man, why are you looking at that? I'm like, man, I think that was the editor who told me no. And my, my boy was like, when? I was like, I don't know, bro. I think when I was like 22 or something, I'm like 45. Who gives a fuck if the editor said no? But so I'm saying, like, my philosophy can also fuck you up at night, and it also can make you so you can't really go out the house because you're always looking for people not who just did you dirty, but who did you right too. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not, I, I'm not trying to encourage people to do that. I am trying to encourage people to revise their own work, yeah. but I, I definitely think I take it too far. Well, but writers, you know, the very nature of revision is we can't let it go. We're not satisfied yeah. by it. We have to re-examine it and re reconsider it and recapitulate it in some ways as well. I, I like that um, that sense of sometimes that feeling and revision of going too far is one of the ways we figure out how far is just right. We almost have to overshoot the mark and then we recalibrate and we step right. back. But you don't know that you overshot it until you've let yourself do that. I think that's right. It. Well, that's right. And, you know, I think often we can we can undershoot too much of the time. I think to find the sweet spot, we have to both overshoot and undershoot mm. in some ways mm. as well. Um, so I, there was, I mean, boy, I'm not, we're going to run out of time before we can get to half of these questions. Um, but I wanted to end up with a couple, one of which I think is um, coming out of the, the, the 
questions in the Q&A here as well. Um, I think it's a question about new work. Did you mention the one of the titles of the work you're engaged in is called Good God? I wonder yeah, if I have somebody a, just... I have a, I have, a, I have a thing coming out called Good God. Um, I, got a, I got a book coming out called All, um, um, Good God, um, City, City Summer, Country Summer, which is a collaboration. It's a kid's book, incredible, incredible author, uh, author, uh, author, I mean, artist, Ricardo Edwards, um, Jamaican brother, who is just doing incredible work um and uh yeah those, those are ones I, I, that i feel comfortable talking about good god um city summer country summer and 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 and, and yeah and some other stuff cool. and i know um when you came to michigan i think you mentioned uh that there's a, a movie version of heavy in the works from isa ray is that right yeah yeah isa isa and, and um and her production company um got heavy uh probably two years ago maybe a year and a half ago and um we are working with an incredible screenwriter on a mansa Ra to to get that screenplay uh where it needs to be i'm excited about that super i mean i'm really nervous about that super nervous about that i didn't want to write this screenplay because i was you know i was like i didn't want to be that person who writes a screenplay of but 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 that's me not that's me also not valuing the art you know what I mean because 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 you could have you could have been like I could have been like oh I don't want to write a memoir about myself but but I, I understand the art of the memoir you can do so many things other than talk about yourself um but but yeah but I'm but I'm super interested in this TV stuff that I'm that I'm that I'm doing but I can't talk about it yet but that that's where that's where a lot of my creativity is right now um because it's a new genre to me and and you can do so many things in it but it's also so limiting and and I love it. That sounds really exciting. Yeah. I, I, I wonder, I mean, as a, as a kind of last thought or a way of drawing us back into that revision space, I sometimes think about um, adaptations or sometimes, you know, uh, response stories, stories that speak back to a previous text um, as uh, revisions by another hand, right? So, yes. so revision is often invisible. It feels like an interesting way of thinking into that. So I'm wondering if... Um, the adaptation process for heavy feels like revision, or if it feels like there's an analog between mm. that and the revision process. That's a great question. Yeah, it 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 feels. You know, when when we started, we first started doing heavy. You know, when you do these films and stuff, just you can't. There's a lot of stuff I can't talk about yet. But but what I can say is, when we first started doing heavy, I was definitely like, I just trust the writer. I want them to adapt it. Take it where you want to take it, and then, <laughs> and then you, and then you see it, and it's not that the work isn't incredible, but you're like, well, <laughs> you know, like there, yeah, like there, you know, like I don't, I, I, I have a political disposition against guns, right? Like, and so in my, and so you know, maybe I told a writer do what you want, and then maybe the writer had some scenes of me shooting a gun, and then maybe I was like, but no, I can't shoot guns. So then I'm like, well, wait, wait, am I giving the writer like all, everything they need to do this? But but anyway, there's there's a balance, you know. I mean, that character, for better or worse, is gonna be named Kiese. And I just don't want a character named Kiese on a big screen shooting guns. Like that's that's but I guess I should have let the, the writer, I'm just saying, I'm using this as an example. I should have let the writer know that before we went into it. Because you know, ideally you're like, oh, do whatever you want. And then you see weird representations of yourself or different representations, and then you're like, all right, hold up. So you know, I'm a contradiction and a paradox and, a, and an asshole, just like everybody else, you know. It's fascinating, though. I'm really intrigued, that sense of, yeah. uh, in a sense, the self being revised, right? Yeah. But by another hand, that's an interesting place to by be at. By another hand. Yeah. yeah, now you feel like your characters, right? That's, yes. That's, that's right. Yes. Right, we have one minute left, so I'm going to ask a last question, and it's an unfair one, of course. Uh, right. But I know you're a wonderful teacher, dedicated teacher. You talk a lot about teaching in really, uh, you know, inspiring ways in some of the books. Um is there one top revision tip you offer to your students? I know one is an impossible question to ask, but is there, if, if you had one minute, what would you tell a student about revision? Hmm. I, would, I, would, I, would, I would honestly tell my student, tell, tell the student, if they're asking me to tell them what to do, because I don't like to tell people what to do, I would ask them to go back through their manuscript and see what happens if every last sentence outside of scene is actually the first sentence and ask themselves if if that kind of rewrite try that for a chapter and see if that kind of rewrite gives your gives your narrative much more propulsion 
and also creates more portals of entry for readers. I think in my writing life, sometimes the last sentences of, of the exposition, particularly, should be the first sentence, and I should challenge myself to keep up the momentum. And, and so that's what I would say. Use those last sentences to be the first sentences and see if more portals of entry open up and also see if you have created a propellant that can keep people interested um, for longer. I love that. That's also a great last word for our conversation. Maybe it'll send people into writing the first words of their revisions along the way as well. And also speaks a lot to the beautiful circularity of this wonderful book as well. So thank, thank you, you, Jesse. This is some, such a pleasure, man. I've loved it. Thank you for your generosity, Peter. I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful. And thank you, Melanie, for, for making this yeah. incredible. I appreciate it. Yes, Amy and Peter, you blew our minds. That was incredible. Thank you mm -hmm. both so thank much. You. Pleasure. And thank you all for joining us. We will put this video up in a couple of weeks so you can watch it again and share it with all the people you love and who write. And uh, there's so much to be taken from it. So thank you again. And we'll see you all again soon, I hope. Thanks, everyone. Good night.